So now we turn to our order of service. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Being a Christian is not always easy, but we serve a master who loves us so much that he was prepared to share our human nature, live among us and suffer and die for us. That love is what inspires us to follow Christ and to come together in worship today. Brothers and sisters, as we prepare to celebrate, let us call to mind our sins. Christ made the ultimate sacrifice so that we can know forgiveness for our sins. For those times when we want the benefits but are not ready to pay the cost of following Jesus, Lord have mercy. For those times when we fail to fully appreciate all that Christ went through for us, Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. For those times when we lack courage and fail to trust God to be alongside helping us, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. God of constant mercy, who sends your Son to save us, remind us of your goodness. Increase your grace within us, that our thankfulness may grow. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we hear now our first reading for today. reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not lag in zeal the ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in suffering, persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints, extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, weep those who weep. Live in harmony with one another, one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
So hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the things that has been hit, sadly, over the past few months, of course, is travel. Things, I'm sure, will return to normal at one point. One of the things that Jan and I would love to do when travel does get back to normal is perhaps another lengthy pilgrimage over a number of days. We've done a fair bit of the Camino de Santiago, and we now have our eyes on the pilgrimage that leads from Canterbury to Rome, the Via Francigena. Now, I imagine that we'll actually restrict ourselves perhaps to the last few, uh, maybe a uh, hundred or so kilometres at the end that leads down into Rome, and not to the whole of the 2,000 kilometres winding through England, France, Switzerland and Italy. Now we've never been to Rome, so there will be a lot to look at there. And alongside uh, the more famous and the must-see sites like the Colosseum, St Peter's, Basilica, the Sistine Chapel, or the Pantheon, there are less known sites that you can go and visit that do have strong resonance with the Christian faith. And one of those is the Maritime Prison. Now that prison is claimed to be where Peter was detained before he was killed for his execution. And he's supposed to have been kept in an underground cell there. And there wasn't a door to that underground cell. Prisoners were either lowered or just simply thrown into the pit through a hole in the floor of the room above. This underground dungeon was dug into the rock and it would have been a cold, it would have been damp, it would have been dark, it would have been a deeply distressing place and depressing place. Being close, of course, as it was to the main Roman sewer at the time, it must have smelt absolutely horrendous. And after his stay in that horrific dungeon, we're told that he was then crucified upside down. Now, whether his prison was here or not, few doubt that Peter was held captive somewhere and we can be pretty sure that he did die for his faith. Despite all that he suffered, however, he wasn't a naturally brave man. The Bible famously describes him denying Christ repeatedly because he was afraid. He was afraid that he was going to be arrested like his master. In addition, church tradition also has it that he ran away from Rome to avoid being persecuted. Under the hand
hands of Emperor Nero. And it was claimed that he only found the courage to turn back and actually face the death when he saw a vision of Jesus heading in the opposite direction, back into Rome. And that reading that we've had today offers us further evidence of Peter's struggle to grasp the connection between Christ, between Jesus and suffering. Now in last Sunday's Gospel reading we heard how Peter received very high praise from Jesus because he recognised him to be the Messiah, the long-awaited deliverer. And Jesus declared that Peter could only have received that revelation from God and that he would become the rock that the church was going to be built upon. And yet, just in a, a short space of time, almost a breath, Peter went from being praised by Jesus to being rebuked and being called Satan. Peter may have realised that Jesus was the Messiah, but he had misunderstood what kind of Messiah he was. Like others of his time, he expected their deliverer to vanquish Israel's Roman oppressors, not to be tried, tortured, and die at their hands. And Jesus' talk of this suffering Messiah shocked, and it angered Peter, and it even provoked him to take Christ aside and to reprimand him. Jesus, of course, rebukes him back. And in his eyes, Peter was acting like Satan because he was tempting him to follow an easier path. Jesus knew that he had to suffer, he knew he had to die in order to bring salvation to the world. And Christ also warned Peter and the other disciples that those who followed him would also suffer like him. However, he encouraged them that despite the heavy cost, following him was worth it and they would be rewarded on his return for all that they had gone through. Now, people are often encouraged to become Christians through promises of a better life, promises that faith brings peace, strength, and healing. And all this is true. But while all these things are true, if we leave the message there, we are in danger of giving a false impression that being a Christian is always easy, and that's misleading, and it creates false expectations. Today's passage makes it very plain that far from promising a problem-free life, there is a cost to following Jesus. Being a Christian may mean that we are mocked, we are misunderstood, or even persecuted. Discipleship involves making difficult and sometimes costly life choices. Now, we might not be dragged off to prison, or worse, in this country, but in other parts of the world, that's very much a reality for those who follow the Christian faith. And in any case, whether there is persecution or not, the simple act of trying to live a Christian life implies a cost, a cost to self with benefit to others. Now, in that other reading we have from St Paul's letter to the Romans, that can be quite a difficult text to get your head around in some places. But the passage that we heard today, I think, is pretty clear. To take up your cross in that passage is to follow a path that challenges, it challenges many of our basic and our inbuilt human instincts, particularly those that lead us to want to hurt, that lead us to want to harm those who have hurt us. In fact, Paul tells us to do even more than that, not just to avoid, as it were, vengeance, but to help those who are our enemies, to give good back for harm, to respond with kindness to those who attack. Now anyone who has been 
hurt by somebody else, and that actually is probably everybody, we will know that it can be hard enough to let go of the wish to harm them in return. But to actually respond with kindness towards those who have attacked us, that is a very costly thing to ask. And that's where this image of picking up the cross is a very apt image for us as Christians to adopt. Now this may seem very discouraging, but although living for Christ can be hard, it is also fulfilling. We can also be encouraged that Jesus promises to reward us for our sufferings on his return, and that he understands everything that we go through because he too has suffered. So we can talk to him about our struggles and be assured that he is right there, right beside us. And whenever we are worried that we're not up to this challenge, we can look perhaps at Peter. He failed frequently, and he lacked courage often. Yet he went on to be a great church leader despite his weaknesses. God knows that we're not naturally strong, we lack courage. What matters is our willingness to serve the Lord. For as Peter's life shows us, God will help us with the rest. Amen. So now we turn to our pause of service and we stand now to say together the words of the Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we sit or kneel to pray. Change. On the 12th of December 2019, things changed in this country. We voted in elections of members of parliament, and through the very simple act of people putting an X on a bit of paper, all the drama of election time unfolded. Surprise winners, devastated losers, the electorate sending out strong messages to our leaders. And on Ascension Day in May, because of everything else going on, this almost passed us by. But we mustn't let the Ascension pass unnoticed, because when Jesus ascended into the heavens, things changed in this world of ours forever. And for the disciples, it was truly a moment of transformation. 
On Ascension Day, the disciples' would, world was transformed, the disciples' minds were transformed, and the disciples' spirits were transformed. Things would never be the same for them again. So let us pray. And at the outset of our prayers this morning, we pray to God about the coronavirus pandemic which affects the whole world and changes it. We pray for all who are affected by coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety that they may find relief and recovery and that we may be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. Lord, in your mercy, for those who are guard, guiding and guarding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, that they may make wise decisions. Lord, in your mercy, for doctors, nurses, and medical researchers, that through their skills and insights, many will be restored to health. Lord, in your mercy, for the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, that they may know your comfort and peace. Lord, in your mercy, for blessing in our local community, that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship where all are known and cared for. Lord, in your mercy. Now we are not that excited by changes in our political systems, though we hope and pray that our Parliament will go about its business with integrity and creativity and in the service of the most vulnerable people in our society. And we forget at times to be excited by changes in our church, when new people come to show their commitment to Jesus and what that means for those around them. The ascension transformed the disciples and it can transform us too. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. Father, we need the power of the ascension in our church. Sometimes we get very small-minded. We're upset if things are not done the way we like. We're easily discouraged by failure or falling numbers. And sometimes our vision is as low as the pavement. Let the ascension encourage us to have the confidence not in our church, but in Jesus' church. Not in our faith, but in Jesus' gospel. Not in our success, but in Jesus' ascension. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we need the power of the ascension in our world. We seem to be aware of more violence, hunger, pollution and despair than ever. Wars and hunger and environmental disaster. We hear about them all the time, and that numbs us. But Lord, let us realize that the ascension reveals another truth to us, because it is about the Son of God who has been glorified and an invincible kingdom. It is about a God who will with certainty reconcile all things to himself. Lord, in your mercy, Father, we need the power of the ascension in our nation. Our culture is tired of politicians who promise but do not deliver, tired of entertainment all around us which doesn't satisfy, tired of trouble between neighbours, tired of religion that promises bread but gives us stone. Lord, we pray that the ascension will put into our hearts 
and irresistible confidence that all is not as it seems, but love, truth and integrity are never defeated, that the kingdoms of, of this world will indeed become the kingdom of our God and of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Father, we need the power of the ascension in our own hearts. Too easily our God is so small and seems to be not there at all. Like the disciples, we find ourselves sometimes standing at the space where Jesus used to be in our lives. Too easily we don't expect Jesus to be present in our worship, to speak in our hearts, or to change anything in response to our prayers. Too easily we remember our weakness and forget his strength. Dear God of the Ascension, take us back to the deep truth of a crucified, risen and ascended Lord, so that we may worship him with joy again and know the wonder and certainty of his love. The ascension transformed the disciples, and it can transform us too. Merciful Father, accept in his grace for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ. to share the We are the body of Christ. In the one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Let us then pursue all that makes for peace and builds up our common life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Would you please The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, you made the world and loved your creation. You gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Saviour. His dying and rising have set us free from sin and death. And so we gladly thank you, with saints and angels praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the heights. We praise and bless you, loving Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And as we obey his command, send your Holy Spirit, that broken bread and wine outpoured 
may be for us the body and blood of your dear Son. On the night before he died, he had supper with his friends, and taking bread, he praised you. He broke the bread, gave it to them, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When supper was ended, he took the cup of wine. Again, he praised you, gave it to them, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. So, Father, we remember all that Jesus did. In him we plead with confidence his sacrifice made once for all upon the cross. Bringing before you the bread of life and cup of salvation, we proclaim his death and resurrection until he comes in glory. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Lord of all life, Help us to work together for that day when your kingdom comes and justice and mercy will be seen in all the earth. Look with favour on your people, gather us in your loving arms, and bring us with all the saints to feast at your table in heaven. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honour and glory are yours, O loving Father, for ever and ever. Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. those who are at home to join in the words of spiritual communion. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me, for all the pains and insults you have borne for me. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I ask you to come spiritually into my heart. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. The Body of Christ. Amen. blood of Christ. Amen. 
Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And before our final blessing, uh, one or two notices just to give out, and also, very importantly, the calling of the bandits. So it gives me very great pleasure to publish the banners of marriage between Catherine Anne Davis of the Parish of Christ the King, Murfield, and Jonathan Haig, also of Christ the King, Murfield, and this is for the second time asking, and between Rachel Georgina Armitage of the Parish of St. Mark's Battersea, and Nicholas Rupert Cook of the Parish of Bootsfield and Titsley, St. John's Evangelist in Hurst Green in Surrey, and this is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any reason in law why these people should not be married, you are to declare it now. So we hold those couples now in our prayers as they prepare for their married life together. Lord of love, we pray for these couples. Be with them in their preparations and on their wedding day. Give them your love in their hearts throughout their married life together. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. notices to see what is here. Um, I think probably you will have seen most of these already so do just take this away or print it off when you get home uh, and, and have a look through them. Um, I suppose the one thing that I would just draw your attention to is the one that's at the bottom of the notices um, and that's to do with the Rhythm of Life RL, which is a, a new diocesan initiative um, which is trying to help us during these difficult times just to assess um, our spiritual lives uh, and, and whether we can get to church or whether we can't get to church, how we can be um, improving our relationship with God and with one another. So I uh, urge you to look at that, at the rhythm of life, um, and uh, follow it online and, and see if this is something that will help you uh, in, your, in your Christian life. I think that is all the notices. I say do please take them away uh, and have a look at them for yourself. Now would you please stand for the final blessing. So the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.